We're at a time when the ch climate is not changing necessarily in some gradual way. We're getting these impacts. For example, extremely strong droughts, extremely strong rainfall events, including hurricanes. The climate is shifting, it's changing. So a lot of our work is focused on how can the science play a role in helping us to mitigate, manage, and adapt. The Carnegie Airborne Observatory, or CAO, is my airborne program. It's really comprised of three parts. One is the part everybody notices, the high-tech airborne laboratory. The second part is talented people that know how to utilize the data. And the third part is partners, conservation, ecosystem management, resource policy partners, where we can work with them to find where our science can have major impact. One of the key measurements is called an imaging spectrometer. That system measures the chemical properties of ecosystems. In the case of forests, when we fly over, we're measuring the chemistry in the trees. Another instrument fires laser beams out of the bottom of the plane. And those lasers penetrate the canopy all the way down to the ground. And we're able to digitize in 3D the shape and structure of whatever we fly over. We have other instruments on board, high-tech, high-resolution cameras. One of the big discoveries was how much carbon is locked up in the forests of the Peruvian Amazon and the Andean Mountains. We discovered massive carbon stores, and those carbon stores are so important that Peru was able to more actively engage the UN process for climate change mitigation using those forests as part of their portfolio of strategies. Then, right after that, we had a breakthrough in my lab where we figured out how to convert these chemical signatures of the tree canopy. We figured out that those chemical signatures actually tell us about the biodiversity in these forests, at least the tree biodiversity. How many species there are per acre, where the species are similar, where they're different. And so we made a whole nother set of maps, the first ever in science, showing us the makeup of the forest from a biodiversity perspective. What that did was it has propelled an effort to reassess whether we're really protecting biodiversity in the most efficient way. There haven't been maps of biodiversity. They do not exist until the, the maps we've made. Once you make the map, there's a lot of adjustment that can be made to protect more of the environment more efficiently. One of the things I'm working on now is taking what we can do on board the CAO aircraft and getting it to Earth orbit. And what that will do is that will allow us to map the entire surface of the Earth every 15 days with the same basic information content that I'm getting from the aircraft. Management of ecosystem resources, hydrology, uh, climate change mitigation, all of these areas require high-tech, real-time, 21st century mapping. Uh, you, not just where a forest is or where a coral reef is, but what it contains and how it's changing. It's no longer uh, good enough to say, here's how much deforestation is occurring. It's better to say, well, we know that amount, but what's left in this forest? Is it high biodiversity, low biodiversity, high carbon stock, low carbon stock? What is, what's the makeup of it? When the science and technology provide clear not just evidence, but pathway for solutions, then people will actually step up and do something about it. I finally got the sense in graduate school that it took this planet four billion years to get to where it is. And when you really think about that, if you can just try to think about what that might mean, it's amazing. And so it's worth doing everything we can to keep our Earth's heritage and history intact.